Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute is the K-Box Belt Squat. Belt squats are a great alternative for athletes who don't handle axial loads well, and a great auxiliary exercise for athletes who need to get a little bit more lower body strength work in. You may sacrifice a little bit of depth when it comes to using the belt with the K-Box, but the addition of that heavy eccentric overload really is a great trade-off. Go ahead, set the belt so that you can come all the way through at the top. Give the wheel a good spin and sit back. I really am a big proponent of having some place where you can hold on for your hands just as a safety mechanism. Push with your feet, keep your chest up, and drive all the way through. This is a great exercise that I'm sure you and your athletes will see great benefit from. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash cvasps to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Tim, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Yeah, fired up, man. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, dude, stoked for this. And, you know, it's it's a small world when you get a lot of people that, that connect each other, even when it's all the way across the country. But for like the half of a human being who doesn't know who you are and where you're at, let's give them the quick rundown of how you got back out to California. So... It's been, I guess, I was actually thinking about the other day, I've been in strength conditioning in some capacity since 2004, where I started off as a high school strength conditioning coach, like everyone probably going back to your high school, no idea what to do. I like to coach, I co played football, so I started coaching football and then, hey, I like the weight room. Eventually it migrated to me taking over the weight room and then that started the process, right? Where I started getting my, I went back for school for an exercise science degree and then boom, 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 a couple internships later, I became an assistant at Springfield College as a GA. And then that migrated into a role at Georgia Tech, then worked at USC. Then I actually got the head strength position coach position for football at Army West Point. And then this past actually four years, this is be year five we're coming up on, been owning and operating a gym here in Southern California called Legit which basically just focuses on honestly repurposing what we did in college with a little bit more focus towards, you know, aesthetics and working with general populations, but for everybody. And uh, this has been going good, man, still open, which, you know, 80% of small businesses fail in year one. So for that level alone, we're a success. And now it's about growing and expanding. And, you know, we're, we're coming into phase two here rapidly where we're trying to actually open up another facility and then in the next year and then we're actually going to open up another facility in the following year so all the all the things that you talk about like oh man now it'd be cool all the the dream like scenarios the fantasies you roll out in your head like it's actually coming to fruition so it's been pretty cool and really challenging and just an amazing process to get to this point i'm excited for the next step no that's rad dude and i think that even more that what's exciting about that advancement is What's intriguing about your educational pathway, because uh, coming from Springfield and being a guy who's been heavily influenced by Charles Poliquin is not typically the combination that we see out of strength coaches. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, you go to Springfield, it's pretty much Mike Boyle. And honestly, like I am, I'm, I'm so happy that I went the trajectory that I went because when I got exposed to Charles, I was already probably way more familiar with Mike Boyle and his stuff. So like you immediately start building in the context, I'm going to work with teams. And I don't know if there's a person has a better grasp or created more of a, a framework to work with teams than Mike Boyle has or group settings in general. And then you get a little bit more granular with Charles's stuff and getting really nitty gritty on the actual 
programming side and periodization, you get a little bit really into the nutrition side, and then you just get exposed to so much more depth, but you can always bring it back and go, okay, how does this apply to a group setting? So as you're running around with no idea what you're doing and you got hundreds of athletes in front of you at the division three level that are willing to run through a brick wall for you, you can tinker and, and explore and try some things and make some mistakes. And as you get out of that, you come out with, okay, I have a pretty good spectrum here. Like I know how to really run a good group session by obviously Mike's tutelage and a big heavily emphasis at Springfield college. And I can get really into the weeds in terms of, nutrition and physiology and biomechanics and program design and periodization and I can go even further into certain directions that you know honestly as you start to evaluate maybe not practical but damn interesting you know and I think that that process has always been honestly a niche that I've kind of carved out for myself which I think is always building a, a level of intrigue or a level of like ooh, what's that guy got that I don't I mean I'm a five foot eight white guy with a bald head so I definitely don't stick out in strength conditioning, but I thought the value I bring to different departments on the knowledge and the and the understanding of stuff based off of just that trajectory has really put myself in a position to be successful. Yeah, and, and I think too that one thing that you can provide people that's really important is that knowledge base being sort of kind of bipolar, right? Like the there are some connections at times, you know, Mike talked for a while about the tempo type things and things of that nature, but really two exceptionally different schools of thought that also have a lot of misconceptions, I think, for people out there in the coaching world. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you could tell the it, uh, immediately the, the Mike Boyle tempo guys, cause they go off of three numbers and then you go to the Mike and the Charles Pollock and guys, cause they go off of four numbers. Right. And that's almost like the, um, the insignia that they wear on their chest when they, you know, kind of put themselves off into a, a category or a camp, uh, which I always find really hysterical. Like, right. Like you start getting into, you know, conversations from both sides and, you know, it's like the whole thing. We're agreeing on 99% of the stuff, but we're violently opposed in 1% of the stuff and we're willing to go to war for that. Uh, I find it interesting when you're kind of crossing over camps and, you know, in the past couple of years, you start going to different seminars, you start breaking out of, the tribe so to speak and you know maybe you've explored maybe functional range conditioning or you know done some stuff with like el dello getting out of like the the tribe so to speak for like nutrition stuff like going into more functional medicine finding guys like mark houston finding guys like dr laval and like and then you come out and you're looking around at the group and you're like man like i don't really have anything in common with these folks or i have nothing to personally connect with these guys like you see at frc some people doing acro yoga i'm like i'm not gonna do that or you see it uh, like a functional medicine type doctor seminar with Dr. Laval, like, you know, guys with lab coats who are breaking down and can talk about literally to the smallest, most minute detail of specific ranges or like the molecular pathways. I'm like, definitely not in that level, you know, and you just, you find yourself very comfortable in both sides. And I think you learn that, like, I remember the first time I went to a Polycon seminar and uh, it was like, you had to pick a side. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. You know, like I like Greg Cook's functional movement screen. I like Mike Boyle's stance on like group based training and how he organizes it. I like this. So I'm not going to pick a side here, but I'm definitely going to appreciate both sides and understand the, the actual redeemable value from that. I'm not going to sit here and say that one's right or wrong. I'm just going to look at what's the best for both and pull. Yeah. And even looking at the Poliquin stuff when it comes to nutrition, another one that's kind of the other end of the spectrum is, is the stuff that Jim does, right? Is it's just another lens to look at such a broad and important topic. Yeah. Oh man. And it's like, you can get so weird, right? Where I, I, I think in hindsight too, like Poliquin and biosignature set up basically one of the most elaborate misdirected pyramid schemes of all time. Like you get like this incredible level of insight and knowledge, and then you get specific access to discount discount supplements that, you know, if you ever look at someone who does a pyramid scheme, generally speaking, they probably buy all the product themselves and never really able to sell it. Where I think with Biosig, if you do that, you're essentially just getting it for yourself with no intent to resell it to anyone else. Um, so in hindsight, I feel like it was a glorified pyramid scheme without having anyone directly under me. Uh, but man, what it does, is it forces you to really investigate and really research is there efficacy behind this and is this actually like something that could benefit elite level athletes because this is that weird feeling of you go okay i'm going to tell someone to take 
at least 10 different bottles of something that have specific purposes based off of a body compositional assessment. And you get really good. And what I wanted to be conscious of, of not just arbitrarily defending it because I felt like it was right, like finding the background of that information and knowing where the shortcomings were and knowing where, like, okay, there's maybe some sort of embellishment here or maybe some sort of exaggeration to a degree, but, you know, like going through, of, okay, like why did biosignature evolve to what it was? Like, right, let's start looking at, you know, insurance-based BMI, right? Where do we store body fat from a waist to hip ratio? Okay, that can kind of give us some sort of Android and gynoid body type. Okay, well, Android guy body types typically have a lot of metabolic stress. They start at a higher risk for type, type, type 2 diabetes or higher risk for, for cardiovascular disease like heart attacks and stroke. Where do they store fat? What are the hormones that are associated with that? They're androgenic, right? So they're gonna probably have higher circulating cortisol. They're probably gonna hopefully have higher circulating testosterone, higher circulating androgens like DHEA and working through that whole process or they're not, and they might be storing it in the lower quadrant and start looking at more of a gynoid body type and you start getting into why are you estrogenic, right? Well, do you detoxify properly? Do you have good gastrointestinal processes? Do you have these things in place? And then you start going through, well, what are the, the, what are the big habits that support that? And you get very precision nutrition. And you're like, what are the things I can do without having to make any intervention from a supplementation standpoint? Like, can you sleep better? Can you drink more water? Can you eat more fruits and vegetables? And then you go, okay, what can I do to support this, do a positive feedback loop of making some investment in supplements? Like, can I get you taking a multi? Can I get you taking magnesium? Can I get you taking zinc? Can I get you taking fish oil? Can I get you taking this? And you start to build in some sort of layers of, okay, we're starting off at some sort of system. We're building in constraints. We see where you store body fat. We can leverage years and years of research going all the way back to Ansel Keys and looking at where cholesterol comes in and how that manifests in body fat accumulation and then we can start building out some sort of process of okay can we just get you living a healthier lifestyle exercising more frequently eating better things managing your stress and then can we take another step of taking supplements that we know are going to be beneficial to you like right like you're burning through a lot of cortisol you probably have some sort of magnesium deficiency you probably have offset dopamine pathways and things like that so okay go through that and then you go into you know dr laval and go through his metabolic code and looking at the triads, which, you know, I, I, I'm so happy and fortunate that I came to the West coast. Cause I, in the past five years, I've really been able to connect with Dr. Laval and taking what I think I learned from biosignature and, and applying it in a more holistic way. Cause one of the first things you go through with him is you get your blood and then he breaks you up into these triads. But then you go meet with him and he starts looking at you from a very Eastern approach of looking at your symptoms, your eyes, your mouth, your tongue. And then he starts doing these meridian pathways that he sees a little bit more of the picture of why you are what you are. And you look at not only is it from a microscopic level, what's happening at your blood, what's happening from your subjective questionnaire that you fill out well beforehand, which is like 150 questions. It's actually at the back of the book, Metabolic Code. He gets into this process of looking at how it manifests into symptoms. And as you start to pull back and in and you really look back through the Charles Poliquin, uh, basically chronicles, like you can start to see some of these, you know, influences, right? Like you can see pimps is like a meridian point kind of assessment and going through that with Charles and working through gua sha or some basically facial abrasion technique and then figuring out the meridian points that are either causing some sort of tightness some sort of overstress or some sort of honestly loose like laxicity you can start to build in some sort of rationales okay this guy's pretty heavily eastern influence and then when he started getting into the neurotransmitter typing of looking at your fire type your wood type your earth type these are all eastern philosophy and then you go into essentially dr laval and like do you ever sit in his office and you see literally probably 30 different types of high level educational based certificates of naturopath, homeopath, pharmacist, and the list goes on and on and on. You start to wonder how he had the time to get all of that. But two, you can see, I mean, this guy's just plucking from so many different resources and he's just an incre incredible resource to put it all together. And then as you start to come back out of it, like, okay, how do I explain this to a person in front of me who's struggling to sleep? Like, you go, okay, like, let's just start from the basics. Where do you store body fat? And I go right back to what I learned at biosignature. And I go, okay, well, 
you store it a lot in your lower body and you're male, what does that mean from a detoxification standpoint? I started asking questions on sleep. Like, do you sleep? No, I go to bed really late. I drink a lot of alcohol before I go to bed. Uh, I eat a lot of inflammatory foods, a lot of processed foods. I eat, I drink out of a lot of plastic bottles. I, ha I live in a high smog area with a lot of pollutants. Like I don't filter my water and I don't eat any cruciferous vegetables. I don't get any of these things in my diet. Okay. You know, do we, does your urine smell like actual asparagus when you when it smell like crap when you eat asparagus? Yeah. Okay. Well, you probably have the MTHFR variant where you don't really methylate well. So let's get you on a B vitamin or let's get you on a multivitamin that's beefed up on B vitamins. And I just keep circulating back to what I started with Poliquin and Biosig. And you're thinking like, man, like how am I going to overcome this threshold of someone going, I feel like you're just pushing supplements down my throat with the intent to sell. And, and you're knowing in the back of your head, like, God, this could have a profound level impact of helping people in a way that you felt like when you went to that biosignature, you just need to figure out a, a more digestible, transferable way that you probably get directly from Charles himself. That, uh, that nutrition plan sounds like about 90% of college basketball. No doubt. <laughs> I guess good, bad, or indifferent. That's just something that we we all kind of deal with. And I think that there are some people that are doing better than others when it comes to the nutrition aspect. But, you know, running down that nutrition rabbit hole also got you involved a bit, uh, you know, with, with a mutual friend of ours again, and, and that's Matt Wan and what they're doing with Momentus. Yeah. Uh, talk about small world, right? Uh, so, and this is not intended to be funny, but when I was at Army, one of my assistants, Will Greenberg, he worked under Preston Green. So we were always, you know, super uh, fanboys of Charles. And uh, Dave Scholes was the head strength coach at Utah State, now at Texas Tech. Uh, Texas Tech. He reached out. He's like, hey, I'm going to have Charles out for a week. Would you be interested in coming out for a week-long seminar with them? And I went to Will, and I was like, man, I want – wonder if uh, this might be one of the last times we can see him because every time you see Charles, his health is just rapidly declining um, in the hope that we live for a long, healthy lifestyle so we can keep plucking all that information from him. But I was like, man, are these times, these, there's a finite amount of times we'll be able to see him. So we better capitalize on this now while we can. Uh, and we were able to go out there and we spent the week with uh, Charles, obviously pulling from a lot of insight from him and then obviously connecting with Dave. Um, and, you know, once you talk to Dave, you realize incredibly smart guy, uh, really, really into it, you know, like very, very like intense level of, of focus. And, you know, just, man, the guy backs up what he's saying. Like he, you, you tell his practice is just as, just as good as what he can potentially talk about. And, and that formed a friendship. And one of the things that was interesting, Dave actually worked with Matt directly when, uh, when he was with the 49ers. And I think he really sparked the interest with Matt. So, um, you know, flash forward a couple of years later, Matt actually started up Momentus. And, you know, I knew Chris DeSanto really well from the time I worked at USC because his old boss, Brad Roll, was an assistant there with us and uh, formed a friendship with him. So all the all the stars aligned and uh, I was able to get on board with Momentus to help out in a performance engineer role. And um, it's been fun, man, because it's you get a chance to geek out and you get a chance to like really connect on, you know, a a, a cool company because they're doing it a way that I think is unique and novel, but they're also really doing their homework and doing, really doing the research. And I was actually just on a call with Matt the other day and I was like, man, I'm, I'm like 30 years into taking supplements probably, right? Like at 10 years old, like you started taking some sort of multivitamin. It's crazy as that seems because you saw it at Stop and Shop because you were a little chubby and you're like, okay, what do I need to do? I saw a fitness magazine and said, take multivitamins. And then you start to, you know, evolve, right? And you start going down to GNC on a, like a Tuesday after school with, you know, your lunch money and you start to buy whatever you can afford or whatever is like, you know, street legal at the time. And you start to experiment. So like 13 years old, Gold's Gym, taking creatine, like figuring it out. And now flash forward to, you know, 20, 30 years later, you're like, man, like I have a really, really long, extensive history with supplements. And I think I bring some, you know, interesting insights from a practical standpoint, um, myself and going through all the biosignature stuff and going through all the stuff with all where, you know, they're really going to, they're really going to test your gumption to take uh, a boatload of pills on a given day, uh, pills, powders, and potions. And, um, you know, when, when you start to, you know, break down and go, okay, like 
practically I have a ton of experience with this, but then on the other end, there's some incredible level of, of just understanding of what works in athletic settings. Like, you know, when you go to a college level and you realize how do I communicate to admin, we need these supplements. And although they may cost more, uh, they think the value is there, but then we look at another level of working with compliance and, you know, having a really good understanding of what is legal here and what can we do work with athletic training, you work with sports medicine, you work with the team doctors, and you have to develop some sort of, of symbiosis of, is this guy going to go around me and think this is poorly executed or poorly researched and try to basically take the carpet underneath your legs out from underneath you and take all this stuff away? Because they don't feel like you should have, you know, autonomy in doing this with your athletes. And I, I was, I was capable enough to really navigate, you know, athletic departments and get in that early. And, you know, places like USC, I think they were a little more restrictive of, we don't really want to take that risk unnecessarily with maybe potentially unproven on research products in their mind, which I was like, all right, well, I disagree with that sentiment entirely. I think there's a lot of efficacy behind this and could definitively help. Uh, but then when you get to army, it was extremely open-ended. Like no one's done anything like that before. And, uh, and then everyone was just like, yeah, whatever you want to do, as long as you can get the money for it. And you start to go to compliance. Like, well, what, what do you feel comfortable I can give? And he's like, well, the rule says you can give any vitamin mineral. Okay. That, that's pretty open-ended. <laughs> like, great. So contact some folks at, at the time, Thorne and Designs for Health. And you start seeing what you can get. And then you start giving out to your guys and you start working through feedback. And, you know, at the end, when I communicate with Matt, I'm leveraging personal experience of, years and years and years of trial and error and then i'm leveraging practical experience at the highest level in the team setting and then i'm leveraging honestly just exposure to some really high level thinking and thinkers in terms of utilization of supplements and almost like a preventative based health model of okay well we can do these things to avoid letting that go manifest into a huge problem and then the most important part for me which has always been the most interest is really trying to get the best performance possible. So when you're talking with Matt, you can kind of give but one end of the spectrum what's practical and what's possible. And then the other end of the spectrum, like what is the furthest reach of like human performance we should really be thinking about. And, you know, like that, that's been a fun exercise and really cool thing to be a part of. Totally off topic. As an upstate New Yorker, I'm so happy you mentioned Will. He's one of like my favorite strength coaches in the absolute world right now because freaking go bills man like 25 years in the waiting for what they've accomplished up there this year man they've, they've been great um, you know what um a funny story i met will I actually met him at picp uh the poliquin seminar and certification level one and two and he was working for preston at the time i was at usc and i mean this is when it was in east greenwich rhode island so we go there and I swear to God, one, we were the only two strength conditioning coaches. And I think we were the only domestic trainers or coaches there. Like pretty much it was all like German, English, Australian guys from all around the world coming in this thing and me and Will. So there was this instant thing like, oh, you're a strength coach. I'm a strength coach. Cool. Let's be friends. And then it evolved into, well, we have no one else here we can kind of relate to. And I mean, I think Will Preston definitely put the fear of God in Will early about like, don't go in there and embarrass me. Um, so I remember like the whole thing about Poliquin, they had these weird quirks, like where you, they had the illegal plates with the screws and you never had the screws facing outward. And I remember putting on one of the biochromial uh, assessments for bench press, because we did biochromial bench and biochromial or I mean, Scott Curl is like a structural balance assessment. And I remember putting the illegal plates with the screws facing out. And he's like, what the fuck are you doing? I like, what does it matter? And he goes, no, bolts never face out ever, especially in a biochromial bench assessment. And I was like, who said that? And he's like, well, that's the way you do it. And I'm like, who said that? I want to know where that's coming from. Why is that so, so important? And he ended up making me turn the plates around. I'm like, man, this guy is psycho about this. And, uh, and it evolved to like the end of the week, we had to do our another part of the structural balance assessment and going through like the movement screen that he has. So like clat test and uh, some of the other tests. I'm like, I don't believe the VMO is the problem. I think it's more of a holistic thing. I kind of default to functional movement screen and looking at DNS like patterns. And I was like, no, it's a VMO. And I remember going back and forth on it. And then, like, Hey man, let me get your number. I'd like to really go back and forth with you. And 
he just so happened to go to uh from florida to appalachian state and i at the time was living in los angeles i was working in downtown los angeles and commuting back and forth from a seat and if you're familiar with the uh, los angeles uh los angeles traffic routes i mean on any given day it would take me two hours to get home so will was living by himself in Boone, north carolina and i was just screw it i'll call will and bounce my ideas off him it became literally a nightly thing like will was always available and i could always be stuck in traffic and man we just talked for hours about strength conditioning about everything and then when i ended up getting the job opportunity at army he was the first guy i called like, you want to come he's like i'm on my way he was there literally two days later and that's like the friendship has been there since ever since that's awesome man that's uh yeah. And like, you know, I'll never forget when Preston was at Charlotte, he would come in and do like a bunch of different, like Poliquin had some, like it was all, I'm sure it was like Douglas Heald stuff, um, but all like the massage type things for activation and releasing hamstrings and all of this. We'd always go through all this crazy stuff when, when Brandon Horrigan was my director because they worked together at, uh, at Clemson. And it was mm. always just like, P always had something new and something crazy. He's one guy I can't believe I haven't had on the show. Like I've, known, I've known Preston for, gosh, it's got to be 15 years. I, I can't believe I haven't had him on yet. But it's, like, it's funny because he would bring up like the intricacies of some of those things with the evaluations and what, what Charles would be doing. And it's, um, there's a lot of specifics that lead to broader questions that dictate some really fascinating adaptations when you, when you peel the layers back. Yeah, it, it is, man. I think that's the fascination behind Charles, like why it was so intriguing, right? Like you never thought you were ever going to get to the end of everything he knows. And that's, that's an amazing thing. You know, like when you actually go to a lecture or seminar, that you're just scratching the surface of what some potentially knows, or at least the perception of that, right? Like, you know, I think he did a really good job of, of one, I think the, 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 the biggest asset that Charles had, and I think why he was so successful was he talked in absolutes and, you know, there was just a comfort and you take solace. And as a young strength conditioning coach that it's binary of like, it's this, and there's nothing else. Everyone else is uh, an idiot, you know, like there's that element, which, honestly as you're starting to try to process all the information and looking at these complex multivariate things in front of you that are human beings and athletes and how really hard it is to actually decide what to do and understand if it was good or not charles gives you such a peace of mind by speaking so definitively like it's this and you're like oh great and then as you start to evolve you're like oh okay well maybe there's there's some more of a, a quote unquote depends kind of situation but there's that element but then there's this like thing, and I get this from Laval. There's a couple people that I really think about like this. And, you know, like obviously, you know, Charles was that way. Dr. Laval's that way. A guy like Eric Otter with the Memphis Grizzlies is that way. Like, man, I can never stump these guys. I can ask them the most off the wall question. I remember going to actually Dr. Laval and asking him about serotonin uptake inhibitors. And like, I didn't give him any preface. I didn't give him any context. I just came out the gate and told him a book I was reading or an article I read. And he just rattled off. I mean, honestly, 15 minutes worth of content related to that without any provocation. And you felt like that was the same way with Charles and, you know, Eric Otter and Bill Hartman. And these guys are like, my God, like the depth and the level of intelligence, these guys just to be able to do this off the cuff. And when you think about Preston, like you talk about a guy who has that level of knowledge and that level of intelligence, but then, you know, he backs it up because he's just, he just has an incredible ability to take that information and apply it and you know as you talk to charles you're like yeah you know part of this is not really applied it's just speaking in hypotheticals which is cool uh and and, and don't get me wrong you geek out but the more you're doing it and the more you realize it like you know the the legit the the, the real master is the one who can master the logistics and not just talk about what to do in theory or or, or in kind of like hypotheticals and you know as much as you love charles and as much as you love these guys like you know, when you get into the, the actual day to day, like guys like Preston become more invaluable because they've done it. They made those mistakes. They've realized the, the shortcomings of just trying to push a threshold of that. And like Preston's got an amazing story on weight release hooks. And you're like, yeah, no, I can see that, <laughs> you know, and like, you know, stuff like that left and right. Like 
yeah, no, I'll have to make those mistakes myself. And then you realize Preston was right. You know, and I think that process too is why Preston's such an invaluable resource. Yeah, dude. And I couldn't agree more. And I think that one thing that's really neat with all of that is that you, you look at some of the people who have been in their system or their, uh, their methods and they, they understand it at such a high level that a lot of us really don't understand. And that's why a lot of these answers are, no, this is exactly how it is, whether you like it or not. Like the, the sky is blue, the grass is green, and this is what we do. And if you don't like it, you're wrong. You know, like people look at, you know, I'm sure that there's plenty of people that thought the same thing that people think of Dr. Yeses, you know, one of my mentors. And, you know, it's like, they're like, you know, he's, he's kind of a jerk the way he talks to people about that. And it's like, well, yeah, because he understands his methods at a level that no one else does. So like you may see a glass of water, but he sees every little space that's open and why there's open and what you need to fix. And it's, it's a totally different game for these people that are experts at their stuff than it is for some of us. Yeah, no, no doubt, man. And you know, like, like, like a doctor, yes, it's like, I could read all the stuff I want to do about him, but until you actually sit there and meet with him and talk with him, you're not going to get really as much out of it as you probably think you are. And I, I think that's a hard part to realize as a young strength coach. I get asked all the time, like, name me your five favorite books. I'm like, yeah, I could tell you those things, but what are you going to do with that information once you have it? And who are you going to collaborate with and communicate with once you start to realize, like, all right, a, a specific exercise based off the task that athlete goes through you know, needs to be incorporated in a specific way. Do you have the bandwidth to go to your track and field coach and go, hey, is this the position that we want to be when we're doing an approach step on a triple jump? Okay, great. I'm going to learn how to overload that. You know, like, I don't think we have that, like, communication skill. It's like, easy to talk on hypotheticals. Again, like, going back to, you know, the talking to Charles and going, okay, great, I'm going to do GVT, but I don't know when, I don't know how I'm going to apply it. Like, you know, and, like, I, I think that, think when we start to break it down like we need to have this healthy balance between not only pushing the threshold with really smart folks like dr yeses and charles and and all these other guys but then having guys like preston green at like hey like i i've gone through what you've gone through and i've applied it and here's where i'm you know now learning that what's applicable with an 18 year old kid who's never touched a weight in his life you know like that that the stuff that i could do with charles is five percent of what i'm gonna do with this kid today because it's just not practical or it's not relevant yeah and like you said earlier like the real master is the one that can master the logistics yeah yeah that, that was an interesting line it's an amazing podcast it's called uh, hardcore history by dan carlin uh, and it's just a super deep dive on events in history and like it's impressive and he'll go like he'll go literally six hours straight on a topic like and he has this one line from this one called eastern supernova and basically like Douglas MacArthur and, and, and George Marshall's plan in the Pacific front. And, and he's like, hey, he, they interviewed this Marine. He's like, you know, the, the amateur talks about tactics, the, the professional talks about logistics, you know, and they, they he shows it like, or talks about it on his podcast of, you know, they landed 20,000 troops in 15 minutes on one Island. Like that's logistics. So that's like mastering the plan. It's not just saying, hey, we're going to get as many troops here as possible. It's like going through the organization and the, the processes to get that many that many people on one island at a given time with you know the incumbents there trying to attack you and destroy you like hey man like i'm looking through programming and i say okay like maybe i want to do block periodization or undulating periodization and i just read this whole entire book from tutor bomba about it and it's an amazing concept and maybe i went a little bit further with bonder chuck and i was okay this is really cool and i have a group of 30 guys who've never lifted a weight before. And you're, okay, let's, let's do this progression. And they don't know how to do the exercise or that you don't, let's say you have the other aspect, but you don't have the equipment or the weight room, right? Like I have 30 people and I need 10 racks to be able to pull this off. And I only have one. You have to find some middle ground there, right? You've got to find some other things and you learn, okay, my context, my setting, what is relevant, what is practical combined with, you know, incredible theory and looking at it from the highest level possible, what would be the best case scenario I could do and then figure out what I can do, you know, like that, 
that constant balancing effect between practical and context and looking at the other side of theory and theory and pushing the threshold of performance. Like, you know, it's like, don't shortchange yourself from the context of pushing that boundaries of what you could do with a human being, but be realistic with your setting and your experience and your knowledge and your ability to execute on a plan. No doubt. Cause at the end of the day, you just got to do what the game demands no matter what. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> your guy, uh, the guy I absolutely loved on that. We actually worked with that, uh, USC his name Sean Brown man he was just so like to the point <laughs> it was amazing right like here's a guy literally doing a traditional high intensity training program right like leg press to failure horizontal bench press to failure you know etc right and like I'm getting exposed to all these you know amazing concepts from free weight and periodization and then you just talk to him right and he's like yeah that's all well and good man but watch a session with me and it's just I mean he's nails it right like it's just start to finish like there was a defined purpose the kid executed on the purpose he goes home and you're like okay well i i think you could be doing more from a you know honestly a performance kind of context but you talk about like executing on a plan it made me do an inventory off of like well let's say that i program snatches clean squats some sort of plyometric drill some sort of speed drill do i have the level of execution that that guy I has with a leg press with a 4040 tempo to failure with an A skip or some sort of high level speed drill that that he does. And if I don't, why not? What was the missing factor? And I wanted that level of execution from thinking like Mike Mentzer taking a literally 22 year old bodybuilder to absolute true failure with no concentric momentum as I would taking someone through a high level plyometric trail, like, like bounding or, or looking at some sort of high level speed drill. And to that process, I'm like, if I can't, do I need better progressions? Do I need to learn how to coach this better? Or do I need to learn how to cue this better? Do I need to go into some wolf stuff, some Winkleman stuff and learn that? Do I need to get better equipment? Do I need better athletes? You know, that whole dis dissection of all these things. And like, you know, I think that's the process where you start to evaluate, like, as I look through on one end of the spectrum, so distilled down and so easy, but really, really executed well, on the other level of so, so intense, and so high threshold, and so complicated, that you're just not as effective, because you're not executing, like finding that balance point. And I think that was a really fun process to evaluate and watching those guys around us. Sean Brown, that's it. West Virginia now? Is he at West Virginia? I have no idea. I just, I crossed paths with him for like two years there. And I was like, I, I remember asking him if he needed an intern because I was an intern coordinator. And he's like, yeah, I'll take an intern. And um, and I just started like going over him. Like, well, what do you do? You know, and I was aware of him because I, I he was over at, um, uh, God, he must have been, where was he at the time? He wasn't at Kentucky anymore with uh, Patino, but. I saw him speak at Charles's. Uh, yeah, he was at UVA at the time. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it was just so pure and so honest. I think he dropped more f bombs in a one-hour lecture than any other person in history. But um, we crossed paths at USC. But uh, I mean, it's just I, I just became just enamored with the guy, and like I philosophically, I'm like, yeah, no, high intensity is kind of antiquated, but I love this guy, and I love the way he approaches just training and how much he works and how the rapport he had with the guys, but it wasn't easy. I mean, those guys were getting worked. And um, I, I think there's a level too of like, man, philosophically, I wouldn't do this, but I want to learn why you do what you do and, and have an appreciation of that. And, and now flash forward to, I work in a commercial gym setting, work with general populations. Like, man, I'm going back through more Mike Mentor, Arthur Jones stuff. I'm Ellington Darden. You know, it was an incredible resource resource called uh, resistance of physics training by this guy named Doug Briglone. And just looking at different origins, insertions, and angles, and different leverage points to create maximal tension with minimal load. And like, I got a forty-year-old guy, and I'm doing compound multi-joint movements. How sustainable is that? If I keep loading him up in these thresholds of force, velocity, or work, okay. Well, I'm going to start to look at some other avenues here. And man, like, you know, like if I can get a three-kilo dumbbell getting just as much results as a ten-kilo dumbbell by an isolation exercise till failure I, i'm gonna take that an option because i gotta get these guys around to keep coming in for 53 weeks if not i go out of business and now i'm thinking about it too i've done so many different conversations with 
you know, basketball coaches out there of like, yeah, I got a guy who's 20 years old. He's playing 40 minutes a night and I don't have an opportunity to really go through some of these complex motor patterns, but I got to put on some weight on this kid. So I got to figure out some strategies where he can play and gain weight effectively and still be functional and resilient. So, you know, you go back, okay, let's look at some machine based stuff. Let's look at, let's look at vertical poles, a lot pull down focusing on tension as opposed to load. And it, it's, it, it, I just think it's such a fascinating thing, man. And I think you get that exposure to Charles, get that exposure to Preston, get that exposure to Dr. LaVal and all these really super smart people. Cause it's like, you know, you just look at it like, man, there's so many ways to do this and there's so much cool things about it and it's Pandora's box, but if I can't apply it, what's the point? Oh man, a hundred percent. Well, you know, Tim, this is, this is some killer stuff, but where can people see, what y'all got working out there? Where can they follow you? Keep up with all of those things so that, you know, they can pick your brain with all this stuff as well. Uh, so in the past uh, year, uh, the beginning of COVID, I had this like credible anxiety of uh, being a, a father and uh, a husband of being able to provide with a commercial business that was an in-person gym space. So, you know, I just, what could I do? Um, okay, okay, I can get an Uber job. I can start to uh, stock shelves at Target. I'm not saying I'm above that, but I feel like that would be way overqualified to do that with my level of education. Um, so I was like, what can I do to purpose my skill set? So I, in the past year, I've just started committing to writing and committing to develop some sort of content uh, that I can, you know, put out there to the world. And it's evolved into this website called Performance Health Podcast. Uh, and I'm just getting now uh, traction. I'm starting to build it out. The website is live, uh, phpodcast.com, where I have 50 modules. It's about 500 pages of writing. Each one's going to sync up with, honestly, several different mediums like podcasts and blogs and things like that to help coerce this learning. And it, it's kind of modeled after my learning style where I, it's just immersion style where it's almost like Ben Franklin-esque or Da Vinci-esque of just saturate yourself with one topic for a period of time learn as much as humanly possible about it and then move on to the next and it keeps my interest it keeps me engaged and maybe it maybe it's other people's style too uh i don't really i never really did well with multiple things going on trying to learn it simultaneously i've always felt like just super intense myopic level focus on one topic and then spread it out almost like training like block periodization of education and uh and, and that's the style so every month we're going to release several different podcasts diving into uh, the principles of it the practical of it I have case studies tied around it and then I have an interview tied in with another coach out there so actually the first one coming up here is with Bill Greenberg again and we're talking about quality control and we're talking about you know how do we approach critical thinking to set up the best overall quality assurance in your practice and and that will evolve next month into variability of movement and looking at why we need to think about that and looking at having a wide spectrum of movement ability so we can handle a lot of different stresses in chaotic worlds. So uh, I've been working on that. Um, so that's live. Uh, if anyone wants to go check that out, our gym is called Allegiant uh, Gym, which is located in California. And our social just has so many different uh, touch points. And we, we, we aren't shying away from, you know, introducing high level protocols and methods in our practice. Uh, we like to think about us as the the spot where your athletes come to train when they're done playing, um, you know, like that whole NCAA commercial of there's a million athletes that graduate every year, only 1% go on to play professionally. Like we're going to take that 999,000 people over with us and hopefully train them. Um, and we kind of being that, that safe haven in terms of high performance, high efficacy, high execution, camaraderie community for them. I um, mean, we're, we're doing well, man. We're really fired up on our product and we're really fired up on potential expansion and reaching a larger market and uh, doing that. But we know a big part of that is it's, it, it's a very uh, differentiated product and there's going to be a long, 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 slow road of explaining what you do and why you do it. As strength conditioning coaches, we understand because our jobs are on the line. We had to choose what's best for our athletes, for our, their safety and our, our livelihood. Um, and as a commercial business owner and a private business, like, I don't necessarily think that level of standard or that that feeling of pressure on us as coaches is there from an education standpoint, from a execution standpoint. Like, I mean, shoot, like most S and C coaches show up an hour before the first lift. Like, it's so it's such a novel thing when our members are like, "Man, it's weird. We don't walk in before you at the at the session," you know. And like, I just find that so 
absurd, um, but we find that's another differentiating quality for us. So having that level of like why you want a, a quality strength and conditioning coach with experience that's actually been in the high pressure, high, high threshold environment, like college or professional athletics as your, as your liaison and strength here, you know, is important. Uh, and we're also going through the gambit of learning too, of like, we want to push a threshold of training by doing really, really high level programming and exercise selection. But we also know not everyone's ready made for that. Not everyone's capable of doing that. So going through a little bit more vigorous screening process in a very expedient manner by using things like force stack and Nord board and, and having functional movement screen. And we got velocity based training going on with all of our racks and all of our, all of our barbell oriented movements. Like, you know, the folks that, that are going through this, it's a seamless integration in analytics and sports science. And I don't think they really understand that this is like a very objective, objectively designed thing. And, you know, them understanding like it's not subjective. It's very, very much a peer reviewed and researched to a high level. So all you got to do is just trust that when we tell you that we think it'd be better to do a unilateral exercise over a bilateral exercise or using dumbbells and kettlebells over a barbell, that it's in your best interest and safety. Um, and, and that process too, I think is something that we are really crafting and working hard to explain. So our actual website, legionjim.com has a blog where we just, man, I, we've probably pumped out a couple hundred articles on that where we're actually explaining that because it's come up time and time again. And, you know, I think there's other coaches that are learning how, right now that to pivot. And um, if you have any questions on that, you probably better serve just searching a blog, going through that. And then you can just hit me up directly. Uh, my Instagram is Tim, Coach Tim Karen, And um, we have a, our Instagram for performance health podcast and i have my instagram for um, allegiate as well so any one of those channels would be great we have an event here at allegiate called muscle mentorship which is largely modeled off of uh, my experience at picp but uh, what i always talked about when i learned at picp was most folks strength conditioning wise or private trainers really never have that one outlet for training for themselves and you know the original thought is fantasy camp for strength conditioning coaches where we throw the kitchen sink at you of everything that we know and everything we're applying, but we also focus on you for a week um, where you're the, you're the athlete that you cater so much to here. And you walk in, we have food ready for you. We have training set up for you. We have the whole world revolving around every one of your beck and calls and needs. And I just, I always wanted that. Like, man, I wish I had what I do for our athletes for myself um, in that way. And that's tied into a lot of education, a lot of other resources and, uh, we consider that a year round, almost uh, exclusive club when you get into it. So everyone that comes to that, we have a Slack channel that I just put all of the resources for all the lectures that we put up throughout the year. You have complete access to that forever. Um, and as well as all the programs. So if you only want to go once, you can see all the programs that we're going to do and, you know, how we're expanding operations and we'll put the rationales of something. So like something like last year, we incorporated a lot of flywheel training in. To be honest, I mean, I think everyone's thinking immediately like, oh man, this would be an incredible thing to incorporate from eccentric overload and the concept we talk about a lot here is strength deficit. I was like, man, what a great way to get some lactic accumulation and get some hydrogen iodine filled up and create some mechanical work to get some sort of body composition changes as well as some sort of hypertrophy response. And, you know, going into that level and, you know, going through some of the research of like, okay, is this working more serious elastic component or parallel elastic component? And and then having a really hard discussion on that, of like, okay, well, what, what avenue is this doing, right? Like, are we going through a range of motion? Are we going through a partial range of motion? Are we getting greater contraction at that level? Are we increasing cross-sectional muscle fiber or are we not? Like all these things are going into some really good depths there. So that's another option as well. Um, just, you know, hopefully we're providing a ton of content and ton of cool things for coaches to learn and grow with. I love it, brother. And truly appreciate all the work that you're doing to help everybody be better. All those accounts, those shows, and if we can even get a link to the to that training, we, we make sure we get that in the notes, buddy. I can't thank you enough for your time today, Tim. This is absolutely sensational. Yeah, man. Awesome. Big fan. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Well, we'll be in touch real soon, bud. Cheers.